Hello everybody and welcome to the fifth episode of Cloud Chases. My name is Christian I'm joined by... Hello. Uh, today uh, we'll be having a little bit of a different episode. Um, we are kind of in a lull preparing for uh, EB01 release and therefore we don't have a lot to talk about. We didn't uh, go to any of the big tournaments. Um, we'll slightly discuss the cheating situation from the online tournaments that happened uh, last weekend. But aside from that, uh, there's not a lot happening in our um, one, one, P, one Piece TCG player lives. Uh, therefore, we'll take the downtime to answer all the questions we uh, accumulated um, across the several weeks. Well, and of course, uh, it depends on how long we go on for because I'm traveling tomorrow, so we kind of need to keep this one short. But uh, we'll try yeah. to go through all of them. And uh, as usual, uh, Adam and the rough. Uh, in the end. Uh, okay, uh, but quickly, uh, of course, Harva, uh, how's your week been? Uh, so, not the best. Uh, I skipped the locals last week because uh, of some obligations, which I ended up not having. So I was just, uh, yeah, very mad that day. And then this week, yesterday, I planned to go to locals, but it was like terrible weather, started raining, very cold, and the bus just didn't show up for like an hour. So I skipped those as well. And those are just the worst when you like... In your mind, you dedicate a part of your day to something, and then you, it all just uh, flips up. Also, today it was like a holiday because it's elections in Croatia, and uh, due to technicality, I could not vote. So, or I, I could, but I would have to put in way more effort than I initially planned to. So, yeah, not uh, the the best lineup of events for the week. But I did uh, grind some rank sim for a change. I think I'm ranked twenty something. I don't know. I, I couldn't be bothered. The uh, the plan is to eventually reach rank one. I, I don't think it's far away. I just playing those last few games. I had other stuff to do, mainly related to this channel, which you will see over the next few days. So I hope you'll enjoy that content that's coming up. And you, Christian? Uh, on my end, I regained my first position on the leaderboard. I uh, I got kind of frisky. Um, and uh, did something that I probably won't be doing anymore, and that is I was testing on the ladder. Basically, uh, took a random deck and uh, tried try to make it work. I lost like 300 ELO. Uh, do not recommend. Just make a smurf account, honestly. Just, yeah. Yeah, but you want the good opponents to actually test. Well, you can have a, an, account for, an account for testing and an account for just uh, playing seriously. Or you can just not care about your rank in the middle of the season, because I think the season ends on, like, May 31st, or something very late, I know, because it only starts with OPS 7 for the for the new season. Yeah, I mean, I've been the number one for so long that it's a thing. I, you, I, you're used I, to the I, role I like to keep of the, the Pirate score. King, like... Uh, I mean, I, I, I got it back, uh, so uh, everything's in order at, at home. Uh, other than that, uh, we are having some slight... Uh, movements uh, here in my house, uh, which I share with my uh, sister. She's getting married, so uh, I'm going uh, upstairs, uh, and uh, she and her now fiance, future uh, husband will will be here. So we're doing some redecoration and uh, demol uh, demolishing, deconstructing some furniture. Um, so yeah, some uh, DIY at home. Uh, other than that, uh, I've been doing, as I said, a lot of uh, black, uh, yellow Luffy testing, which I'll be doing um, a deep dive on Patreon. So not a full guide, because I didn't play any big tournaments, and it's only I've been only at it for like a week, slightly more. Uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a deck that really requires you to know what it does to play against it. So therefore, I think that even a deep dive explaining everything around the deck and uh, how the deck functions, how to play with it, how to play against it, will be valuable. Uh, other than that, yeah, not a lot. Uh, locals as usual. Uh, you... Can I spoil it? I, I think I can. Uh, you can actually watch uh, one of our local games. Uh, me and Haravaya played finals of uh, 30... 32, 30 people? I don't know, locals. 30 something. Like. 30 something, yeah. Um, it, it was 
an interesting game. For yeah, sure. I mean, it might not be uploaded when this podcast is uploaded, but sometime this week, that and a few other so, games we filmed on that day are going up. So, yeah, I'll, I'll be doing editing on those still because we have another uh, lengthy video coming up. We finally did the what reviews for um, yeah, that is for right. Krefeld, and uh, that's like three hours ish. So yeah, we'll go through all the games. <coughs> oh yeah, and since I forgot to mention, but uh, yeah, Christian is doing a dive on Black, uh, a guide, a deep dive on Black Hill Luffy. And I'm also doing like a shorter guide on Reiju. I know she's like kind of uh, with RP Law coming up, she might be like a bit dead in the water, but she's still a strong deck in EBO1. Well, one of the best performing uh, players in Southeast Asia qualifiers got fifth and just lost on tiebreakers uh, with Reiju. So she's still strong into going into EBO1. So I figured there's, a, there's still some use for a guide. And then I'll be moving on like full time to Red Purple Law for. No, not for tournaments now, but just in preparation for OPO Seven, as that will be my uh, the, my extensive guide in, in the same vein as the Sakazuki OPO Six that I got some really good feedback for, and yeah, Christian also got amazing feedback for uh, for the Gecko Moria guide. Yep, we I mean, we always appreciate the the praise, uh, and especially and seeing the, the good results and people shouting us out. Oh, so of, of course, like thank uh, you to people. Everyone. People showing how they performed uh, and thank us for it. It, um, it doesn't seem a lot. I, I think to them it doesn't seem like a lot, but to us it really like makes it seem worth it. As in, uh, once you see that the things you do are actually effective and you did it well, uh, that never gets old. Okay, uh, shall we, before we go to the questions, shall we quickly address the cheating situation that happened in uh, less regionals? So yeah, I think it's best we don't name the player, because there were multiple cases of uh, of cheating recorded, as recording is allowed in these online tournaments, but yeah, there's no reason for us specifically to drag someone's name through the mud. I feel everybody already knows who uh, who some of the people that are guilty are. In any case, uh, April 13th, uh, Raid and Trade Online Regional, there were several cases, notably of the winner, uh, just uh, doing very shady stuff, bringing cards out of the field of view of camera into hand. Uh, winner specifically played in a very dark room with uh, black sleeves. Uh, and yeah, he had the history of doing this because in the previous online tournaments that he played, he also had games recorded where it was like, wasn't immediately visible on the camera, but he would like take a hand out of frame and then like go around the frame and add it to his hand. He had a much lower like field of view to cut off most of his body and uh, yeah, just add stuff to hand. And yeah, all of his good performances were like in online events where he had very weird lists with all the one offs, which are really good if you get them in specific moments. Uh, and the reason this sparked such controversy is because these incidents. Uh, his and a few others were reported during the event, but Raid and Trade staff allowed the players to play on and only dealt with them afterwards, which to give credit to them, they did uh, adjust the standings, disqualify all the players who cheated, uh, didn't send them out prizing, obviously. Uh, but yeah, the reason it sparked so much drama in the first place was because they were allowed to play on even after video evidence was uh, reported to the judges. And to a degree, this is understandable. Judges, I, I, I was in this role before where you have to review video content. You're basically one person for the entire server, so it's possible they just got flooded with a lot of videos to review and just couldn't do it all uh, like in time without like seriously prolonging the tournament uh, because the round would go on for like half an hour more to review everything. Yeah, I, I mean, if, if you think about it, uh, there's not a lot of time between rounds, right? Because uh, you record your game, and the judges usually uh, can only expect it at a few games, right? And they're basically jumping uh, between uh, games. And usually people send the videos after the round. It takes time to and upload as well, so... Yeah, it takes time to upload. It takes time to download. And then you have to watch it. it it's prob... And you, as a judge, you can probably watch one or two games... In, in a span of a single round, right? So it definitely takes quite a bit of lag to, to actually consume and um, see what uh, what's happening. And not only that, there's quite a few, I presume, tickets being created, as in people uh, 
sending uh, videos of alleged cheating. So going through all of it, I understand it, it takes time, but I also understand that people really feel uh, impotent, I don't know, uh, powerless uh, by catching someone cheating and nothing and happens. perhaps possibly. losing the game because of it and then you just see them play an extra round on table two or something. Like, okay, yeah, yeah. I guess they and just now, get away with it. And not only that, you lost the game, you have to continue the tournament with the loss, and technically, only they will get the penalty. You will not get the retroactive win or anything, right? Um, you, you just get damaged mental because you have a reason to tilt. But exactly, exactly. So, in your case, you got not only got cheated, but you cannot get to win, right? So, uh, I understand that it's extremely, uh, a very frustrating yeah. uh, situation. Personally, no, no I, other way to put it. Yeah, personally, I wouldn't mind if the rounds went on like 10, 20 minutes into overtime just to make sure that cheaters are immediately disqualified and uh, awarded losses for the previous match. Uh, but yeah, I understand that's not very practical from a tournament organizer perspective because I assume they have a, an expected time to finish the, uh, the event by. There is the advantage of the fact that it's not held in a physical venue. There's no like uh, time that you have to be out of the door by. You're just... Uh, you can run the event until midnight if it's necessary, which hopefully it wouldn't be, but you know, if it is, like there's nothing really stopping you from doing that. Like obviously players are not going to be happy, but like I think at least competitive players would not mind uh, the event dragging on just to make sure all the cheaters are disqualified. Uh and also I think just generally in those cases you should prioritize like higher tables. Because if the XO bracket has a potential cheat and the X4 bracket has a potential cheat, the judge would probably review the XO first. Because X4, all relevance for pricing, obviously, uh, there's still going to be player dissatisfaction either way. But, you know, if you have to sacrifice one, uh, it would make more sense to prioritize the the ones fighting for, like, the big money prizes. Because we are talking about th thousands of euros uh, worth of pricing in these cases. For your local equivalent. Yeah. Um, I agree uh, with, with everything you said. The only thing is... We've been talking about online tournaments for a while now. Everybody knows most of the things the way you can cheat. And that after a year and a half, we get such a big incident. And it's not just a little thing. It's the guy who got first cheated in an online tournament. For the second time. That, that's the for real this, kicker. And that's the thing. Also, yes. And not only that, the person who caught him... Uh, and we know it because uh, I think we had dinner with him. No, it's no, actually I, one of the judges. It was one of his friends that uh, that played. Oh, against. one of his friends. Okay. Yeah, uh, and anyways, he uh, there was like definitely proof that he cheated once, and uh, and you know what? I I wouldn't even be surprised that Bande doesn't ban him for this because. He already got cheated. He already got caught cheating, and nothing happened. Maybe now because it's such a high-profile thing. But sorry. Yeah, in the end, it's on Bandai. It's them who should be like as strict as possible on cheaters. I don't think like you remember the case when uh, the guy who won the regional in Toulouse, where you got top eight, you played against him on feature. He 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 was a cheater. His brother was a cheater, and. Uh, he eventually did get banned from the game, but it was like a six-month ban or something equally funny, which is just Bandai being ridiculous. Like, if somebody cheats, they're doing it intentionally, and they have no business in any competitive card game. And to me, that should be at least two or three-year ban. Like, six months is nothing. Three months, which is also the issue in some cases, is like, uh, it, it's a circus show at that point. Like, why would you even ban someone for three months? They're just going to come back if they want to and keep playing and maybe cheat more carefully. Like, just permanently ban... People who cheat, that, that's my stance on it. It's, yeah, it, it's on Bandai to, to put an end to such cases. And, like, a very harsh punishment is a good deterrent, given that there is strong incentive and in, in very strong pricing to to cheat for people who who want to make money on card games. Uh, and, of course, yeah. we're, we're talking about intentional cheating, right? Uh, yes. There are often times that people get a loss for... Something that you cannot even know that they did on purpose, right? For
for example, I always feel like if someone has a marked sleeve in a way, there's a very real possibility that they didn't know about it and they didn't catch it, right? Yeah, but I mean, we were talking about cases where we, you saw the video, I believe, where there, it was exactly. Yama, Yamato against Moya and he like drops his hand in the trash and like counts out fake counters that don't exist. To me, that's like a no-brainer. Like you're never playing this TCG again and nobody's going to miss you. Like, I agree. That, I agree. When it's real intentional cheating, then you should be very, very strict. But all I'm saying is that there are some cases where... The intent to cheat cannot be as clearly. Well, yeah, obviously th that's like the whole point of like judge investigation stuff. I, I mean, I've judged a lot of events, so I know how it works. Like, you are not going to get disqualified if you if you have a single marked sleeve. Like, you might get the game loss if it's like indicates a pattern because it's a one off in a deck or something. Mm -hmm. But generally, like these are there's penalties and they're appropriate to like uh, the level of infraction, which we always as judges have to assume players are playing with you know good intentions. Because most right. players are like the cheaters are the the exceptions. It might not seem that way because when there's a cheating scandal, it goes uh, viral very quickly because it's something you don't want to see in the game. It's like bad news spread. That that's how the entire world works. Like that's how news work, and it also works in card games. But the majority of players, like ninety five plus percent, ninety nine percent even, they're honest players. They're not going to cheat you. But there's going to be these exceptions that uh, need to be need to get caught, need to be dealt with. Uh, and yeah, it's up like it, it's a difficult part as a judge to determine that someone is for sure cheating. But the default assumption is that it's not a cheat; that somebody is making an honest mistake uh, and doing their best to uphold the integrity of tournament, up integrity of the game. And yeah, that, that's how those decisions are made. Only after careful investigation, which is why video footage is so useful in online tournaments, are such decisions made because they are hard decisions to make. So all in all, uh, record your games. Uh, don't lose hope. Cheaters can and will get caught. Uh, be vigilant. And uh, stay safe. Uh, yeah. The online tournaments don't seem to be going away, so we kind of just have to accept it, adapt to it, and uh, continue to play the game we love. Yeah, I mean, the, the good thing that came out of this whole thing is immediately another tournament organizer, No Heroes, they responded by updating their set of uh, policies for the online tournaments. They posted new instructions that you might have already seen on how your webcam setup should look like. Like it should, you should have your like playmat and then like space on the sides, left and right, and then your body should be visible, like hey, cards you hold up to your like chest, so that there is no like room to funnily grab cards from above and put them in your hand. Like you, you need to be showing uh, like the surrounding area around the playmat as well to make sure that the cheating is minimized. And they will. They said, we'll see if this is enforced, as they, they're they saying it will be. But they're saying they will penalize people who don't have setups which fit the, these criteria. And that's a step in the right direction, because, once again, people are playing for massive prizes. Uh, they practiced a lot, and getting cheated out of online because your opponent has, like, first life Soul Pokus, second and third life Kikunojo. Yeah, that's just uh, a kind of a joke. Okay. Enough about that, let's uh, get to the meat and potatoes of the episode, which will be the questions from you. Uh, let's start with the first question being from Stanley, I believe. Yeah. He asks, uh, preparation for a new set? Question mark. Like when practicing for a new set actually starts, how much consideration goes into picking the deck and how the testing process works in terms of groups or just him spamming? Well, we always start a new set with a set review. We're basically doing it in front of you uh, with uh, ST, uh, uh, the brother, ultra deck, whatever. Um, and usually we did it always uh, by ourselves. But whenever a new set comes out, we, sure, we, we are aware of the Eastern meta and what's cool and what's popular. But we always go in into a set with an open mind, try to find what's strong and uh, what interests us to, to start playing, right? So the first thing is identify the strong cards. We go through the whole set, we pick out the strongest cards and see what can we do with them. After that, we mix in decks, we play, uh, we play some uh, together, we play some on the sim, 
ranked sim is really starting to be a mainstay in our uh, preparation simply because it's very convenient even though uh, we're good friends so we are we don't have an issue uh, contacting each other at all times of day for for testing but uh, we do have private lives and uh, things things are happening uh, and we're not always in sync uh, when we need to test so just being able to whenever you have the time pop up um, uh, a program on your computer and spin some games um, via sim is very rarely variable also uh, we did find out that actually it's not playing in real person is somewhat different than sim uh, simply the feeling is different, the headspace is kind of different, and even though you can learn a lot of theory playing The Sim, playing in real life is, we feel, kind of irreplaceable, because most of the tournaments you'll be playing uh, using real cards. So, just doing the thing you will be doing at the tournaments is something you should at least do a few times. So, never mistake I wouldn't say never mistake. Uh, sure, do your testing on the sim, but touch grass, take some cards, uh, and uh, move them around uh, non-sticky service called Playmat. Um, Want to continue? Yeah. Um, so I do things a little bit differently. I pay a decent amount of respect to the eastern side of the game uh, because. Oh, did you do that? They they are playing the thing like, it, it would be very rude and uh, what's the word I'm looking for, egotistic maybe to assume that these people who have played and optimized the format for three months before we even looked at the cards, uh, that they reached the wrong in conclusions. So I always try to like, assume that they they landed at a good spot by the time we we get the cards and usually it's true. Uh, like, rarely there are any innovations that we can do in the West, given we have the same ban list and everything. Uh, so, yeah, what I do is I tend to follow the Asian meta a little bit. Mainly Japanese, because Japanese players produce the most content for the game. So I follow, I've watched some gameplay channels, uh, namely uh, Teacup, uh, no, Tea Faction, or Teacup Faction, I'm not sure. Uh, and Manji Pirates, like... Uh, T faction is uh, some really good players. I believe the Japanese uh, number one representative at Worlds. Uh, oh no, sorry, sorry. The the guy that qualified with Zoro, he is part of the T faction. If I remember remember correctly, Natsume. I could be wrong. Uh, in any case, uh, they do very high quality gameplay, but they only upload upload like once or twice a week, maybe even less. And then Manji Pirates, they do a lot more videos, but their quality of play is. It's not as high, but it's still like educational just to see uh, what the new cards do, how they perform in real games. And then okay, you put the links to all the um... yeah, I'll put them in the description. Mm -hmm. uh, and then sometimes I've stopped doing this like as of three or four months ago, but I did it for Opio Five. I tried to see if there's like a a good no dot com article that's like the Japanese Patreon in a sense, but instead of buying a subscription to uh, to the full uh, channel, as you can do with our called Chasers TCG Patreon, uh, they like paywall specific articles that they write. So you can buy an article for like 500, 600, 700 yen, which is like five euros usually. And what I do is uh, I type in the search term for, uh, for one of the leaders that I'm interested in because I see it's popular. And then usually the first, like maybe the first chapter or something, there's like an intro that's free. And I just throw that into DeepL and see if the player who's writing this seems like they know what they're talking about. Usually they will list their accomplishments. And then if I'm like, okay, this might be good, then I go and like spend the five euros, translate the rest of it, and uh, see if there is uh, any benefit. And sometimes they're not, not good, but yeah, I just do it here and there. And it can be very informative when the, when the articles are written good. Uh, and then, yeah, then just the cards arrive. Christian and I have a uh, set review session, which from, as Christian said, from Three Brothers Starter Deck is now public, as we'll be doing uh, and filming them for all the upcoming sets. EB1 coming in a few weeks. Soon. 
And then uh, the cards actually arrive when we get to play. And I'm always the one forcing IRL testing. I'm really not a fan of testing on the sim. Uh, I think it's like fine. Like you can learn stuff, but I much prefer the feel of actual cards and uh, playing with actual cards. So I always try to get us to meet up and then spend a few hours testing. In some cases for extreme amounts of time, there have been cases where we just uh, uh, went to the local game store and played for like 10 hours and went home. Uh, and usually we do these like hardcore testing sessions at the start of the format because that's when you need to extract the most value, get the most information before everybody else. Uh, and then you can reap the highest benefits if there's early events. And then from then on, it's mostly just cruising, slightly tweaking the builds, updating, uh, exploring uh, like new builds of stuff that's already known. Uh, basically, we want to get the bulk of testing done early. It's the same as studying. Like the more you do early, the easier time you have later on. And yeah, that that's pretty much it for... Yeah, I'll just emphasize two things and then we can move on to the other question. Uh, I'll once again emphasize this thing you said that we really put a lot of effort into a new set as soon as it comes out. Because A, uh, that's also when you need the most time to get familiar with the stuff. So it's going to be the hardest. And B, it's knowledge that's going to carry you through the whole format. So you invest early, you get benefit now. And not only that, you're going to get the most out of it because not a lot of people can prepare and spend so much time uh, so uh, on such a short notice. Therefore, especially in those first few tournaments of the new format, uh, you're going to uh, have the highest benefit. Uh, and the other one is about the Eastern Meta. Uh, disregarding the Eastern Meta will, uh, will be helpful. Like, there's some knowledge and information you should absorb from that. At the other hand, on the other hand, you should not be blindfolded by uh, by the Eastern Meta. For example, the K2 list that the Italian boys cooked up, uh, if I recall, didn't ever show up in, a, in, in an Eastern uh, tournament. And that's currently probably the strongest deck in the game. Yeah, and also their Whitebeard list in OPO3 that uh, didn't run Rush Ace, which was like the... They, they ran only the Thatches and stuff. Uh, their the the Solar they, yeah, version. Yeah, and I guess... The, the red purple Wolfie, obviously in OPF four point one, but that's also not the meta they had in uh, in Japan because we had the separate ban list at that period. But yeah, it, it it's a great showcase of how preparation can pull you ahead. Yep. So uh, do your preparation early, and do not be blindfolded by the Eastern meta. Like don't follow it religiously, but the other hand, like definitely do research. Uh, some, at least at the beginning. Yeah, like, okay. j just one one last example, OPO5, mm. Sakazuki. Uh, we obviously had a lot of success in the format, but how did it all start? Like, two or three weeks before OPO5, I was pretty sure I would try Sakazuki back when it was revealed because I was always waiting for a good blue-black leader. But, like, two or three weeks before the actual release in English, I just started testing, I started theory crafting, playing every deck. And then the list I landed on for Treasure Cup Paris, and the list I played for Worlds, like, almost one yeah it's four months later i think the difference is just four cards because all the conclusions i made very early on they just stuck i i didn't have to test i, I still tested a lot during the the entire opio5 format because i wanted to be prepared but those conclusions i made early through like a decent amount of early effort they, they were they were still there and only just small tweaking through the format happened and all the preparation was done basically in those first two or three weeks before the set even released so, yeah, the, the earlier you do it, the easier time you will have later on. Okay, on to the next one. Uh, another banger question from Stanley. He asks, what's our favorite part? Uh, favorite parts about traveling to events? Because that's what we do. We do a, a lot of traveling. Uh, for me, I... And we're going to circle back to this. Uh, I really enjoy trying new stuff. So, whenever we can, if we can... Uh, if we can find something um, of a different cuisine, I'll always be interested in that. Uh, we usually really like walking, if we have the strength, so we'll walk for quite a bit, uh, see the sights. Um, we, we usually wouldn't... 
we never do anything before a tournament. We just arrive, test, do the tournament, and then if we have the time after the tournament ends, we can uh, do some sight sight sighting. Famously, after Paris, we did quite a lot of sighting. Um, so yeah, uh, traveling to tournaments is definitely different than traveling as a tourist. But uh, we try to squeeze in as much tourism as we can. You finished? Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. for me, it's definitely... I'm, I'm surpri surprised you didn't mention it, but it's just meeting new fee people and forming new friendships. Oh, yeah. uh, I think there's some incredible stories that I think justify our name Cloud Chasers. We have this weird tendency to just become friends with people who later on just become like goats at their games. Like... If you think back to when we went for Flesh and Blood to Krakow, uh, that's probably your, one of your favorite TCG stories. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Let, you're, let, you're, me tell, let me tell it. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, there, uh, one of the most famous <coughs> American players is Michael Feng. And uh, at a side event, I'm playing him in the finals. Like, are... uh, it's eight-player side event. One of those, like, uh, single yeah. elimination. Just basic side event. And we were joking, having a really good time, and that was the time when the first Pro Tour was happening. It was like, a very big thing. Like two months before that. Yeah, and I got qualified, uh, which wasn't an easy thing to do, because um, you basically had to win a relatively competitive event. Uh, a smaller event, but... It was an achievement, like, it's a little regional tournament of 50 uh, players. So, not only that, because of that, uh, I was the only one to qualify uh, from our basically uh, whole friend group. And it's in New Jersey, so it was going to be expensive, and I was supposed to go there alone. So I was really, I basically decided I'm not going. And Michael basically told me, dude, that's such a dumb reason. You, you should definitely go. Like, it's the first Pro Tour of, in the history of the game. And you got qualified. You should definitely come. I'm like, you know, I still don't know. And he's like, dude, I'm going to host you. You'll be at my place. I'll show you around. Just, just come. Like, dude, are you really serious now? Like, if you're offering, I, I, I might just take you up on that offer. And he's like, definitely, definitely. Come, I'll, I'll take you to some nice restaurants and uh, we'll play games and you, you can be there. I'm like, you know what, Michael? I think I'm going to take you up on that offer. And what ends up happening is I spend a week with Michael uh, playing cards uh, having some nice dinners and playing in the Pro Tour um, which all I'm trying to say is from that point on I definitely got very very deep into being a professional TCG player and it's all thanks to Michael uh, one of the best players and one of the nicest players uh, in all the card games uh, who basically showed up and uh, gave such a great opportunity to a random guy he liked, uh, which he met in a tournament in, what, an hour of talking. Um, I, could, I, I could never thank him enough. Yeah. And uh, sorry? No, no, go. go. Yeah, you, you left out the important detail. So his friend that he, he came with, like later later that day, Yuan Jili, yep. he wins the whole event, like uh, calling Krakow. Like the guys, ju guys we just made friends with, amazing, turned out to be like amazing players. And it's not the only case of that happening. Uh, but yeah, I cannot reiterate how uh, how kind and good of a person Michael is. I can generally, I don't think you can find any anybody in any TCG who can say a bad word about him. Uh, he he's also an, an amazingly good player. He won the third Pro Tour, I think, in Baltimore. Uh, pretty sure he has a fiance or a wife. Uh, do, do, I mean, he definitely has one. I'm just he not has sure a if shop, it's fiance or uh, 
she, Run the yeah, card she, store. She we'll probably we'll mm -hmm. dig up a link and link it. Uh, we owe at least that much to him. Uh, yeah, definitely one of the. <laughs> we like, there's, there's so many stories of his like kindness and just being one of the nicest human beings on the planet. If there's a, a card game player you should have as an idol, like someone to aspire to, you know, should emulate, Michael. it should be Michael Fang. It's for me. It's not even a debate. Uh, but yeah, also. Uh, how did we meet Yoris? We, we decided we want to go to Calling Utrecht, once again for Flesh and Blood. And we saw there's this small Belgian town near the border with Netherlands that has like a competitive tournament, I believe a road to nationals in St. Niklas. And we're like, okay, sure, why not? Uh, it's like two days before the big event. We just stay extra two days, get a little more practice in, a feel for the meta, because it was the first big event uh, in that format. In round one, I'm paired against this guy who's playing the same deck as me. But already in turn one, he makes such a stupid move that I'm like, wow, okay, I'm going to have the freest round one ever. Like, thank you, Belgium. And then it turns out he's really good and he has a deck decked for mirror. So he ends up flipping the game and destroying me because, yeah, he, he just <laughs> played it out of his mind uh, after that uh, turn one fumble. And that was Joris Verhelst, the Treasure Cup Hanover champion in December. Uh, a really good One Piece player as well. Yeah, but that, that's spoiling a little. We have a little bit of story before <laughs> him winning the. Yeah, but uh, th that, that's where we met him. Oh, yeah, also Flesh and Blood. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He, he, he won some things in Flesh and Blood. Some he... notable things. But yeah, that's where we met uh, him, Alex Kivitz, who both became our good friends uh, for Flesh and Blood Worlds in 2022 in San Jose. I stayed, I roomed with them and. Uh, some other Belgian and Slovakian friends, uh, Peter Markovic. Uh, uh, oh, I, I'm breaking on William's name. It is William, right? It's William Kubik, I think, right? Oh yeah, yeah. Kubik. Okay, uh, just one of many cases of like great people we meet in. We met through TCGs. Uh, Joris hosted us twice in his home in Belgium when we traveled for events and there. And really not hosted We're, us, like really, really hosted us. Basically. Uh, there were two events which were relatively close by, and <laughs> at some point we tell, uh, we come so to we, we, we were playing uh, One Piece Regional in, in Germany, and then next weekend is a uh, calling Flesh and Blood event in Belgium, in Antwerp. In Belgium, right, correct. And we're like, uh, Joris, what are you doing for the whole week? And he's like, guys, you're kind of crazy, but uh, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And we... Definitely thought what he was thinking. And yeah, basically, uh, we stayed at Dior's house for a week, uh, played uh, games with him. Uh, Alex dropped by. Uh, yeah, we tried all the PCGs. It was yeah, yeah. a very uh, nice time in Ghent. That's like one of the probably the nicest nice cities in Europe. Like yep. just a beautiful sure. city, a student city. So a lot of stuff to do as well. There was a festival we visited. Yep, yep. Uh, so yeah, we, we had a great time, and uh, yours was a great host. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so can't can thank Yoris. both Michael and uh, Yoris enough for uh, yep. just being great people. Um, but yeah, just yep. some I mean, of the, all, all these events really propel our love for the game and makes us want to move on because there are such positive experiences that uh, you're definitely itching to to. Make some more friends and uh, be at more events. Yeah, and I'm also uh, to, to 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 skip to the to the end of the story about Yoris. Then he's basically not playing One Piece for a while, and we are constantly talking about One Piece, constantly talking about One Piece. He's like, "Okay, fine, guys. I I'll, I'll pick up Sakazuki and I'll go to regionals. Okay, fine." And then he wins the whole thing. And he he's the guy who who Kaido pilled me. Just for the record, I was a Mihawk believer, and then we did a lot of testing. And once again, that, that Kaido inclusion in the deck it worked wonders. It was hard. Just, uh, I can definitely attribute uh, my recent successes to him. Because uh, Kaido was that fucking good. There's just like, you can meet so many good people, and one of the nicest things about TCGs, when you meet them at one event, and you go to the next event, you meet them again, and you can just, you know, exactly. build that friendship up through years. And yeah, it's to me that's like way above tourism and uh, food because yeah, Christian knows I'm not much of a food guy. Or like 
I, I want to try new foods, but they're not a priority. I want to see new places, but mm -hmm. uh, events to me are about performance. Uh, I want to get there. I want to do as best as I can. And then if there's time left over, depending on how we scheduled our flights and whatnot, we can do other stuff like climb the Eiffel Tower in minus five degree weather in December. Uh, it was but to cool. me, yeah, to me, that's not a priority. But meeting new people, that's something you do naturally because you, you sit across them, uh, talk with them, uh, meet up between rounds. Like, there's just so many great people we met playing other TCGs and now One Piece as well. Uh, like, obviously, for, for me, Fabian has become a pretty good friend. We played and met and talked in so many different tournaments. So, yeah, for me, the favorite part is easily meeting new people, uh, socializing. Uh, and yeah, I guess there's a second part to the question. I might uh, skip uh, ahead. Quickly, I'll, I'll, I'll just have to say one more thing. We often, often people say that meeting people is the shit, right? The, the greatest thing. But a lot of people are introverts and find it harder to um, connect with other people, start talking. And I should really urge you specifically to, to try it. And my gift to you is the fact that it's so easy. Like, you're all there, you're playing the same game, so you basically have something to talk about. You're most likely, you most likely both watched or read One Piece, so you can talk about that. And there's so many topics regarding One Piece that you can just start random uh, conversation with people super easily. So, um, if you find it hard to approach people in general, but you would love to, I think being surrounded by people who have shared interest with you and it's not like, oh, I, I watched some One Piece. No, no, these people dedicated uh, a decent amount of time to at least the game and probably uh, One Piece as a whole. So um, do not despair. It's, it's way easier to approach people than you think, at least at the venue. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but yeah, about the second part of the question, uh, differences between North America versus EU versus Japan tournaments. I mean, neither of us has played the North American event yet, so I, I will play one soon. In so one piece, yeah. I, I'll try to remember to to answer this in the next episode, like just as a side thing. And I haven't really... Like, I only played small tournaments in Japan, and it was locals. And compared to Europe, like... In Croatia, we have pretty big locals for, for a car game. It's like... Often gets over 30 people, which is not the standard in other car games. In Japan, it felt like 30 is <laughs> laughably a small amount. Uh, easily, they, they don't always do official tournaments. A lot of stores run, run like their own cups and stuff. But yeah, as I shared, I think so, either on Discord, either on Twitter, I signed up for an event at a store, an unofficial event, and I got waitlisted. Capacity was 82 players. And I didn't get in. I was like 15th on the waiting list. Uh, some American players got in. I know Cross and Jonas and uh, I think Jackson got in as well. And they played the event. And then I got in next week. So I played uh, the locals again next week. Basically, there's a ton of players in Japan, at least in Tokyo. I don't know about other cities. And I don't know about uh, their big tournaments and their competitive tournaments. Uh, but yeah, it felt like there's a lot more casual crowd, like people playing all kinds of wild decks. And there's just generally more crowd, uh, like more people to begin with, at least compared to Croatia. I haven't played the locals and the rest of the Europe yet, though we did try in some of our travels. We did try to track down places that uh, had their own locals. Uh, but for big tournaments, yeah, I only have experience in the European ones, and I don't count World Championship as a big tournament in the same sense, because, yeah, the stakes are high. It is a World Championship, but it's a complete it was, thing. Yeah, it was 16 players. It was not big in the you know, big sense. So, yeah, I'll go to Niagara Falls this weekend and hope to perform best and then I'll share some uh, thoughts about... Okay. Uh, so to, to, to wrap it up, uh, sure, food's nice. Uh, tourist stuff, yeah, sometimes, but meeting people uh, is... Uh, I think you remember for your lifetime. And as I said, once again, that one event like completely changed my life for the next couple of years so uh once again uh shout out to michael love you brother um okay next question from fox in flows he asks uh would love to hear something about you and yourself 
What do you do for a living? Are you professional TCG players? You're traveling so much around the world? No obligations at home? Question mark. How many hours do you spend per day, week, month on this game? What other sources do you use to get more insight into the game? Shall you start? Uh, yeah, I just give me a moment. I, I realize you have another question, but we might not have the time to cover it uh, uh, in this episode because we are kind of limited on time. Uh, but yeah, what do you do for a living? So for me, it's a bit of a, an odd question because I do have a job, but it's uh, not a full-time job. And it was never like something I did out of financial incentive just because just did because I like TCGs and their communities and wanted to be a participant in it. So I run an organized play for uh, for game store in Croatia, Magic Omens, for uh, Yu-Gi-Oh, which is how it started, uh, Flesh and Blood, and uh, One Piece. Uh, so yeah, I that, that is technically my job, but most of my uh, financial... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The way I make money is just uh, card trading, like buying cards, making meta calls and stuff. Or that, that at least used to be the case with One Piece. I, I always aspired to like uh, perform in tournaments and have like tournament winnings, which is like the professional thing to do. Like if you if you want to make a living out of playing card games. Uh, but before One Piece, that's not like really a fully a possible thing because One Piece pricing is so much uh, more crazy than in other card games. But now, I mean, yeah, uh, it's not that much crazier. But the tournaments are so much denser. As in, they're like, sure, Flesh and Blood has basically the same pricing for a calling as a regional, right? But in Flesh and Blood, a regional uh, uh, a calling is once per three months, at least in Europe. Yeah. And a lot of people are preparing uh, quite hardcore, and like. It's a completely different beast, uh, and basically playing in three, yeah, oftentimes three tournaments per year. You you're not gonna perform at every one of them, uh, so it, it it was quite hard to to make a living out of it, even though we were both quite good at it. Yeah, now that you mention it, um, I I will be playing like a ton of events in the next month and a half. And most of them are in Europe. So, like, I'm doing Niagara Falls this weekend. Then I have the Raid and Trade Online Regional uh, next weekend. Then it's the Raid and Trade Online Treasure Cup. Then I, I'm not playing in Milan, but theoretically, you know, if I got the last chance ticket, I could also play that. That's, like, four events already. Then the next week is to lose. Then the week after that is the, the other No Heroes Treasure Cup and the Organized Play Events Treasure Cup on the same weekend. And then the week after that is the Birmingham uh, Treasure Cup, the offline, at uh, the UK Expo. So in theory, you could, in the next month and a half, play... I, I could play eight events if I got tickets for all of them, which I, I don't think I have the for the for one of the online Treasure Cups and obviously for the Milan Regional. But yeah, the density of events is insane. And that, that just means you can uh, compete way more. And then the idea of being a professional TCG player is much more viable. And now there's also this added aspect of, you know, if we run Patreon, if we make content constantly and, like, we, we get support from from you guys, uh, that also adds to the possibility of, you know, just uh, making a living playing TCGs, which is a nice goal to aspire to. Not my uh, end goal for life, but uh, it, it is a, you know, a cool thing that you are able to I don't want to say it's not nowhere near esports sta- status like uh, video games, but just the fact that there's some possibility is still very nice. Um, um, yeah, I guess you can so move, answer the first set of questions before we move on to the next one because there's like five questions in one. Uh, on my side, I got my degree in math and computer science. So, uh, living an engineer life, I worked for a couple of uh, video game companies as a game designer for five years. Uh, and after that, I got a little bit about, uh, into teaching math as a math professor. And for the last year and a half, I think, almost two years now, I've basically dedicated my life to uh, TCGs. And 
I make most of my uh, income th through that, whether it be uh, coaching, whether it be uh, prizing from the tournaments, and of course now uh, making content about uh, One Piece DCG. Um, and it's scary, it's weird. We're basically growing up when I never thought that this will be my way of uh, earning uh, earning for a living and it's kind of scary because it's unconventional and also very risky we we can never know what the future outlook for us is and can we still keep earning money playing card games but as of now, I'm really enjoying it, um, and also I've, I've been pretty good at it. I've been playing card games and board games for a lot, a lot, a lot of time. Um, I also did some board game design. I still freelance as a board game designer uh, on a couple of projects. So. I'm coming from it as a, as I I think I mentioned a couple of times uh, from a game design perspective, and I for my like basically pure love of uh, games in general. Uh, that's why you will also see me uh, slightly mention some other card games or board games that I obsessing at at the moment. But yes, uh, for a while now, both of us. If you'd have to ask us, we are professional TCG players. For every day, full day, we we play cards. Um, he's asking also, uh, you're traveling so much around the world, no obligations at home? No. Uh, we are both uh, young bachelors, so no wife and kids, uh, which makes this also quite easier. If uh, one of us got married, um, we would probably have to reconsider what what we are doing because the risk involved and also the erratic nature of our schedules makes it pretty hard uh, <laughs> to, to live a normal life, basically. Um, which is also why we also feel like we have something to offer to other people. Uh, not many of you can probably spend your whole <laughs> Uh, waking life, uh, thinking and playing card games. Um, you just want to hear what the people who do that think. Uh, so no, no obligations at home. Uh, how many hours do we spend per day, week, month on this game? Well, sometimes we take breaks, but uh, dude, I, I, I started dreaming One Piece, uh, definitely. Uh, I don't think there was ever a day where I didn't spend at least two or three hours on the game. How about you? Um, so yeah, just to go to the previous question for a moment. Uh, yeah, no oblig obligations at home. As Christian said, uh, well, he has a girlfriend, I'm pretty sure, but uh, unless that, that... I, I'm not married. Okay, yeah. In any case, yeah, I don't. I'm single, so just uh, no obligations of that sort. Uh, some familial stuff, fa like family stuff. Here and there, but generally uh, the part-time job, the tournament org organizer thing, is pretty flexible. Uh, like Magic Omens is very understanding because once again, uh, it is the professional TCG aspect is what they focus on, uh, and yeah, they're just uh, amazing people to work with in that regard as well. So I'm quite flexible on when I can grab a a weekend off and just go play a tournament somewhere else. Uh, as for how many hours do you spend per day, week, month on this game, uh, I'm probably not really good at making that estimate. Uh, specifically on playing the game, it's probably a lot less than people think. Uh, I'm not the type to to open the sim and start grinding for two or three hours. I, I will when I feel like I need to. And early on in the format, I will try to test as much as possible with Christian and, uh, and other good players I know, mainly Christian though. Uh, as we've mentioned in the first episode, we've been testing partners since Flesh and Blood days. Uh, but I don't specifically count only playing the game as uh, as preparation. I do a lot of... I'm, 
sounds stupid, but I, a lot of my thinking time during the day, like at least a few hours, is always dedicated to One Piece. Just when I'm doing other stuff, thinking about... Like, th there's a lot of theory in this game which you can directly apply to gameplay, notably about the curve, about possible plays, uh, anticipation of matchups, uh, possible card decks, a card decks. Uh, and yeah, sometimes I just uh, I have pieces of paper that I write down curves for, like, this is not very visible, but just a random paper. Yeah, that's not going to show. Basically, me doing calculations on some specific gameplay patterns where, in this case, if you if you see Gekko Moria on your first search with Tashigi and Sakazuki, how you should uh, count your searchers and make sure that when you reach late game, you can actually cycle into it off the top, which is a very minor thing, but, you know, might, might be very useful when you some games. Uh, that type of theoretical stuff is something I'm very invested in, that I think is most easily translatable to other people to help them improve. And obviously, we, we are doing a Patreon, so that's something I want to do. And I also want to improve myself. That's, uh, that's an important thing. So, yeah, I might not play as much as some other players. I do try to play a lot, especially IRL. I think IRL testing is more useful. Uh, but yeah, if I had to estimate it, it would be like two hours a day between playing and thinking on the game, pure theory, crafting... It's probably I mean, more, honestly. Like when it, I, it's definitely more, but but I, I would say that that's the bottom line. Like at at least two hours. Yeah, because obviously I'm thinking about the game a lot, and then <laughs> I'm, I don't count the hours in my head. Like mm -hmm. it's uh, definitely a decent bit of time. Um, actually, I have no idea how I arrived to such a low number. Like I play the locals, like every locals I can get to. Obviously, the big tournaments. Put in the ranked sim grind like, here and yeah, there. Sure. Write articles. If you think about, it's, if you think it's about probably just goes our like locals, four, five, six hours. We have three locals per week. So basically, every listen, other listen, day, I suck. I suck at estimating numbers. Okay, just uh, leave okay, it at that. So every other day, we spend over three hours playing IRL. That's like a bare minimum. And on top of that, all the other stuff. Yeah, and so, all the hours we do before or after local sometimes, and yeah, yeah. Yep, and yep. And listen, I suck at estimating numbers. Just and then the other times. So I, I, I'm gonna up my uh, lo, lo, lower um, uh, estimate to I think three or four hours. Yeah, I, I think four hours now seems like a minimum. Now that I really, uh, mm -hmm. uh, like, put it into perspective. So, yeah. Okay, and then uh, what other sources do you use to get more insight into the game? Well, Hrubba is uh, a little bit more uh, on that research side. Basically, I, I try to find um, YouTube channels that I would like and that I would get insight. And it, it, it's not about me like not wanting to help my... Uh, I guess they would be my... Uh, what should I call it? Competition? No, I, I, I would really love to point you to a YouTube channel that I adore, but I just didn't find. Uh, I, that's one of the driving force that brought me to uh, to start making content for One Piece because I had such a hard time finding good One Piece content. Uh, what about you, Hrve? I think you you do find some more uh, valuable stuff to do online. Mm, on the Western side, like. It's very limited. Like, there's very few people that if they publish an article on their Patreon, I'll be like, okay, I'll go read it. Usually, it's just uh, I think just if Kai does something for Cross AI's uh, Patreon, he he does like uh, he used to do them for free on No.com, but he writes articles in English which are very in depth and very high quality. And the only like uh, the catches they're usually about some offshoot deck that's not the most popular. Like in Opio Two, he did a very good article on Film Kid. In OPO4, he did one on Rebecca. And I think in OPO5, he did it for Uta. But it, the, at that point, it was locked behind Krosiai's Patreon. And eventually, I did pay for it. I was like, okay, I want to read it because, like, when this guy writes an article about something, it's really good. I go and read it. Uh, and it's always worth Like, he, he does the type of guide I want to do, which is, I hope, obvious in the OPO6 Akazuki guide and the OPO5 variant. And in the future in RP Law. Uh, just very in-depth, very very high quality. And that's the only type of content that really like uh, impresses me. 
There's sometimes an article of that sort on no.com, but once again, those are in Japanese always, so you need to go like open DeepL and copy paste section by section. And in some cases, okay. even after translation, you need to like uh, like navigate the maze of uh, card game slang and stuff because it, it throws out weird translations. But yeah, generally, mm-hmm. also not that much content on the Western side that I find uh, worth consuming. Yeah. Yep. So most of our time is spent either thinking like theory crafting or playing the game. We, regarding the content, uh, we just didn't find any. Uh, oh, to really be fair, our time. We, we do it like uh, we don't pay for other patrons usually. Like I sometimes yeah. do it for, for Cross CI, specifically for Kai articles. Uh, and I did, I think, pay for Jackson's sometime last year, August or September. Uh, just because I had some ideas for Zoro and his aligned with mine a lot, so I was like, okay, nice, nice, I'm on the right path. Because at the time he was like the goat of uh, of Red. Um, Anyways, not, not to ramble too much, so let's move to the... Yeah, the, the, the part I want to emphasize is, if you buy someone's Patreon, one of the pro players, they're probably good, like, possibly, like, better than us. Like, they, they've been moving it longer, they, they might know better. Uh, in any case... We don't use that as a source, but it's probably a good source. Just uh, putting that out there. And we're not trying to this, like, we only consume the free content, and that's the free content that we think is generally lacking in the Western Hemisphere, and that we hope to change with uh, once we diversify our YouTube portfolio a little bit. Yep. Uh, which we hope you'll see very, very soon. Uh, Trich asks, what's your favorite food? Well, uh, as Hurva said, uh, I'm having a constant battle that I'm uh, frequently losing of uh, wanting to try interesting cuisine uh, and being surrounded by people uh, infatuated by McDonald's and KFC. Um, so more often than not, uh, we just do the vanilla stuff. Uh, and I would be hard pressed uh, to, to hear something exciting from Harvey regarding his favorite food. Yeah, I, I just uh, uh, went to check if I have McDonald's socks on. I don't, but uh, <laughs> I do own pairs of McDonald's socks. Just uh. my favorite food, on the other hand, uh, I have two, uh, which I really really enjoy uh, locally. One is called um, Pokeball, which is basically a Hawaiian dish, uh, very basic and uh, with a lot of d- different flavors. It's basically rice, and on top of it is a lot of Stuff. Uh, my favorite one is uh, truffle salmon. Basically, it's mango, um, onion, spring onion, uh, salmon, um, uh, truffle mayonnaise, uh, some other vegetables, uh, and it's all very, uh, very fresh, very succulent i would say yeah v- v- very like um, juicy uh and the other one is called kotu that's a sri lankan dish i think basically um uh, they take very thin um stripes of uh pasta i would say uh in- integral pasta um and they uh, they slice it together with chicken, some cheese, uh, some spring onion again, and they basically uh, form it in uh, in like a like, like half a sphere, um, and it's super super tasty. So those two are for me. So pokeball and uh, kotu. Okay, mine is, mine is much more traditional, and I'll be much shorter to explain it. It's called sarma. It's like cabbage rolls, like rice, minced meat, and a cabbage roll. Uh, it's the typical grandma's cooking in these parts of the world. And, you know, grandma makes best food, so e- easy choice there. That's all I got to say on the subject. Okay. Uh, we have some more questions, but it, it seems that uh, we don't have the time to, to tackle them all today. Uh Keep them coming. Uh, we really enjoy uh, answering them. Uh, shall we move to Diamond in the Rough? Yep. Uh, Take so, it away. if you don't mind me introducing it, this is one of my personal favorites from very early on in the game. Uh, when, if you remember, in OPO1, uh, I played green, but the deck I played primarily was not 
used as Captain Kid, it was Kozuki Oden. And this card never really made the cut in that deck, but I always thought it had really good potential. And it's You Can Be My Samurai. The one cost green event, Land of Wano slash Kozuki Clan. Uh, main, you may rest two of your characters. This is a cost. Uh, draw two cards. So on surface level, it's quite expensive. Requires a, a board commitment already. Uh, and you need to rest two units, which means they cannot attack to draw two cards. And this... Also has no trigger, right? And it has no trigger, yeah. And obviously no counter because it is an event. So this is quite a few uh, very glaringly obvious downsides. But then where does the potential for this card lie? Well, there's some decks that can spam weenies, like cheap units, which will have some on-play effect where you already get value out of them. And then as we know, with these small units, attacking isn't really worth it. It's very difficult to get them into attacking rage. It's very difficult to... To like present real threats with them, usually you need to combine it with cards that reduce power on the opponent's side. Uh, the deck this card is probably the best suited in right now, does have that because it's red-green law, combines the two great colors. But yeah, basically once those small bodies are on the board, you don't really have a lot of use for them. Uh, you can attach a lot of dawn and, dawn and attack, but it's better to just develop board. Uh, but what if you don't see the options to develop board? Well, having a card that's uh, one dawn and one card from hand to draw two, Sounds very appealing. Like these types of effects, the pot of greeds of different card games uh, carry a lot of potential because you go deeper into the deck, you find the options that fit your curve. And when you think about it, if the cards that you play down on the board already replace themselves by drawing, well, you don't really mind if they get attacked even. Like if your opponent has their own searchers, it's slightly, slightly worse because you're losing them for free. But if they're attacking into them with bigger units because it's like still a 3k body like uh, Dadan or... Uh, or something of that sort, well then it's just like good value for you. They attack the unit you don't want to attach Don to anyways to attack. And then obviously there's the benefit of decks like Red Purple Wall, where you can just shamble stuff back into hand when it's rested, replay new stuff, uh, get effects again. So yeah, I just think it's a card uh, that has quite a lot of potential, but yeah, you can, before I give my final thoughts, maybe you can share your first impressions as well. Yeah, I mean, drawing cards is always going to be strong, like... That's the thing that they can hardly power creep. Uh, like, I think by definition, it, it can basically only get power creep by other card draw effects because cards are what's strong in One Piece, right? We rarely have thing which has strong fundamentals. Maybe Yamato is the first and if I can recall only leader that has a strong fundamental, as in uh, you just attach Dawn and can attack and do great things. You you don't need cards, right? Uh, but 95% of the decks work by playing strong cards, and drawing will always be strong. Um, the card is great if it's a card which says pay one Dawn, draw two cards. The requirement is a steep one. On the other hand, the requirement is also a one where we can get a lot of support down the road uh, because it doesn't ask you anything else. They don't have to be a certain type. Your leader doesn't have to be a certain type. You just have to rest two bodies. If we ever get, God forbid, if you get a card which makes to little tokens of something, right, which are not cards, I don't think they probably want to go that way, but it's like other card games did it, so they might. Uh, this might be crazy. Uh, card effects like Moria, which basically play cards not from hand, but from graveyard. Basically, any kind of flawed effect where you play a lot of cards on the board. Uh, they all bump up the stock of uh, my Samurai. So the the card definitely has potential and somewhere down the line I can see it. Yeah, the, I mean the the downsides are are quite numerous I would say. <clears throat> Not having a counter, being situational, um keeping your board is 
pretty tough uh, at, at, at this point. Uh, Lucci is a menace. Like, the whole game is... And the lightsaber. Yep, yep. The whole game is kind of bended. Bended. The whole game morphed around uh, that effect of uh, cleaving two cards. And it, it's kind of hard to have even the little bodies stick. Um, but uh, as long as we have good little bodies, usually the ones which uh, replace themselves, right? After you play them. So they are card neutral. And we'll always have those kind of cards. But if we have a critical amount of them, and also a deck which utilizes them well, which historically has only been uh, Regain Law, the potential is there. Uh, it's strong. However, yeah. um, I still have my doubts. Yeah, uh, there's also the under the underexplored angle where you can have just one small unit, and then just play like a six cost seven k guy that has some one play, like maybe a removal or something, and then you just play this and rest the small guy and the big guy because if if you remove something on your opponent's board and they have nothing to attack your big guy with, if it's like a seven k, like they're not going to attack into into the character. They're either going to remove it with effects, in which case you know he would die anyways. Uh, either they will attack your leader. If they attack massively into it, you just white grey buffed your leader and drew two cards, so now you have an easier time defending uh, said unit. So there's always that angle of also resting the big guys on the turn they are played, alongside something weaker, if you cannot maintain a full board uh, through the game as a whole. Obviously another example, since it's green specifically, uh, you can hide your small stuff behind uh, like uh, the 8 cost kid, uh, there's also there's also those like searchers which are like kind of fake in that once you play them they have like little to no uh, real value on board like the Buena Festa and I believe Green Otama in Opio 7 where they're like 2k's so you play them they search and then they're just standing there with zero power you're never gonna attack with them they're just there on the board if you can rest those and get two extra cards why not because when you think about it if you play like one cost searcher one cost searcher play this it's like you played Two ser like you got two searchers, like hand filters, and then you drew two cards, which is like kind of Sanji's feel, feel off. Because you spent three mana total and have the overall plus one card in hand. Uh it has also like those My scenarios. Is that, uh, one piece is a game where card velocity is uh card velocity we mean that that's how many cards you see uh per game. Seems like a lot, but a lot of your cards will be um dedicated to countering. So, all I'm trying to say is deck space is really tight in one piece and dedicating X amount of cards to just card efficiency, so searchers and um, I want to be a summer, right? Uh, really narrows down your options. Uh, whenever I'm making a deck, I'm, I'm always surprised at how tight uh, Every deck ends up feeling, and I often ask myself, would I even be in the market for one of your samurai? And the answer is actually often yes, because getting cards is always good, like generically good, and all I can say is, and that's gonna be my final. Um, I think we can really only get more support uh, to make this stronger. Meaning that this card is probably at its weakest, and it's only gonna go. It's only gonna go up from here. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, currently, there is obstacles, and those obstacles might be uh, a bit too much. Green generally, as a color, has not the. Uh, had a good time, well, basically since OPO one when it was uh, the most dominant. Uh, but there's room for growth there. There's a lot of uh, potential for Land of Vano, for any green event support, and in general for control decks which like to draw cards. Uh, and this is one of those cards that might just uh, one day be a four of in every list. Just you know, one cost draw two. Can't get better than that. Okay. And with that, uh, we're gonna 
bring this party to a close. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your time with us. Uh, send us questions, send us feedback, uh, talk to us any way we can. Join our Discord. There you can talk to us any day of the week. Uh, uh, be on the lookout for some gameplay from us. And of course, I hope you uh, put your uh, smiley face on your calendar for next Wednesday when the next podcast drops. Yeah, and if uh, you're in, in fear at Niagara Falls, you should definitely like come and talk to me. I'll be there playing, but uh, obviously between rounds, I'll happily talk to anyone about anything. So maybe see you there. Okay, and with that, we bid you a farewell. Take care. Signing out. <laughs>